Hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us for this session today. My name is Catherine Barker and I'm really, really pleased to welcome you all to this Spotlight webinar where we're very pleased to be joined by Mark Phillips, the Senior HMI and the National Lead for Music at Ofsted. So it's going to be a really interesting session, I'm sure. The discussion is around curriculum and Mark's going to be doing a presentation for us shortly. But I'm sure we'll talk and cover other topics that are on people's minds. We're getting to grips with the new framework at the moment in our schools. We've also got the research review, which has given us lots to think about. And it has been so refreshing, I think, from certainly from my perspective, but I know that others feel like this, that Offset are really engaging with the workforce more than ever before. And you can also do that here in the session today by uh, submitting a question through the Q&A function in Zoom. If you're watching over Facebook, you can also type a question there and we'll pick it up and we'll pick uh, after the presentation, we'll have a chance to go through some of the themes of those questions. Uh, Mark, uh, we're really, we're so pleased to have him with us. He's really uh, a very experienced um, inspector, but also more importantly, a really passionate musician and educator. I know he taught music in English in secondary schools as an AST. He taught music across uh, Key Stage 1 right up to Key Stage 5. And before he was at Ofsted, he had leadership roles in local authority music service, I think in Northamptonshire, but I might be wrong with that, uh, and also worked in a local authority school improvement service also been involved in ITT so he's got extensive experience across the sector but for about the past 15 years he's been leading inspections of primary and secondary schools monitoring schools of concern and is now the national lead for music as well as one of the senior inspectors in London so uh, without any further delay I'll hand over to Mark for his presentation thank you very much Thanks ever so much, Catherine, and thanks to everyone uh, for coming this afternoon. It's really important to say thank you. I think in education, we don't say enough, really, uh, to each other or um, to, to our schools. So a real thank you from me. Um, it's exactly a month today, I couldn't help noticing, until Christmas. Um, and I know full well as a full music teacher just what that means for you as music teachers um and i just want to pay tribute to you for all the work you've done over the past couple of years and this christmas is going to be quite special isn't it because we're going to have christmas concerts and shows back again in schools hopefully um but it's important to say thank you to you for all the work you do day in day out during the year, not just saying thank you in the head speech at the end of the Christmas concert, which is very welcome, of course, but to say thank you for the work you do in the curriculum day to day in schools. And that's why I'm so glad today to be talking to you uh, about, the, um, about the curriculum. And as you can see, I've called my talk today, uh, not just a series of activities, because the curriculum isn't just a group of activities. You'll see that um, HMCI, when we launched our research review, talks about uh, doing music not being enough. Just doing the activity of music is not enough. In the same way, we don't just do maths or don't just do art or don't just do English. It's about a curriculum, a, an incremental progressive curriculum. That's what I want to talk to you about today. So a big thank you from me. Um, do follow Ofsted on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm always very pleased to engage with people and to hear from people their views. And uh, I should be looking with interest at any, any feedback we get from today's presentation. So thank you in advance for that. There are lots of myths about Ofsted, and uh, some of them uh, are quite a lot of created actually by, by head teachers and by uh, industry saying this is what Ofsted wants, they want this, they want that. Um, and uh, one of the things that we do want, and it's not a myth, is about the curriculum. When we come to schools, we expect in every subject to see you meeting or exceeding the ambition that sets out a national curriculum. Now, that's interesting because, you know, academies and free schools very often say, this, well, 
we're not obliged to follow the national curriculum, and you're not. But we expect you to meet or exceed in whatever you do the ambition that's set out in the national curriculum. And actually, interesting, that applies to independent schools as well. You know, when we inspect non-association independent schools, we expect to see the ambition that you're setting, meeting or exceeding that ambition of the national curriculum. Now, when we talk about this to schools and talk to head teachers about this on inspection, a common um, resource is well there's not much in the national group from as if music and on a very superficial level that's true there are only two pages for example key stage three two pages in national curriculum and people often say to us well there's not much there uh it can be covered quite easily can't it well superficially it can but actually, there's a lot of detail in there, and there's a lot of guidance in there, a lot of thought in those two pages that very often gets missed when people are planning and delivering their curriculum in schools, particularly at key stages two and three. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. There are two sides to the national curriculum music. You can see here, these are pages taken from the, uh, the orders. There are two sides. On one side, you have the aims, and on the other side, you have the content. And my experience, and my experience in schools and inspection, is that most schools think by ticking the aims, by covering the aims, they have covered the national curriculum and they have met requirements, whatever that means. I think it's, uh, it's wrong to think that. And I think uh, in, in many ways, you're missing the points in the national curriculum if you think by ticking the aims, you're meeting the ambition. The most important part, as I'm going to show you in a moment, is on the other side of the, that two-side document, the content. Let's have a look at those aims first of all. Because you know, the aims in national curriculum talk about performing, listening, composing, singing, covering the elements or the interrelated dimensions of music, and covering different works, different styles, great composers and musicians. And most schools, when they audit their curriculum and they talk to us on inspection, will say, yes, we do performing, yes, we do singing, yes, they play instruments, yes, we use music tech, yes, we listen to a bit of Bach, a bit of Beethoven, a bit of Dvorak maybe, but we listen to music from around the world, do a bit of pop music. We do some notation, we have a module notation, and we cover the elements of music. That's not ambitious, that's the bare minimum, and it's certainly not good. And it doesn't mean that you're going to give children a good music education because you can tick all of those boxes. What's important is on the next page. And there's some key words I'm going to show you now. They're on the next page to give you an indication of where the key parts of curriculum planning should come. Let's take key stage two, for example. Now, the content, and this is just an extract from Keith's show, of course, but the content there has got performing, singing, listening, history of music. It's all there. The key bits are in red. Pupils shouldn't just play instruments. They shouldn't just sing. But as they move from year one to year six in primary school, or in key stage two, three to six. Their singing and their playing should show increasing accuracy, increasing fluency, increasing control, and increasing expression. As they listen, their oral memory should be increasing as they move from year three 
to year six. It's not just memorizing names of composers or pieces to listen to. Oral memory is her ability to retain sounds and um, you know to, to reproduce sounds that have heard and to sing back phrases. And developing an understanding of the history of music isn't just notching up uh, a repertoire of pieces you've listened to, you know, ticking off 10 pieces, but it's understanding how those pieces fit together over time and how music develops over time. So in the curriculum, the key part is in the content. And the key words in the content are the ones in red. Let's go to key stage three now, because there are similar words in key stage three. That developing musically, developing fluency, developing accuracy, developing expression as they move from year seven to nine, the increasing sophistication of their use of chords, of their use of key, of their use of scales as they move from year seven to nine. The increasing discrimination as they listen to music between years seven and nine, and their deepening understanding of music they perform and which they listen and its history as they move from year seven to year nine. And those are the key words in the national curriculum. And so if you're planning a curriculum, Normally, when you go on an aeroplane, you'll turn left for first class, I believe. I've never flown first class in my life, but I believe you turn left for first class. In the music curriculum, turn right for first class. Focus on that right-hand page, the subject content, not on the left-hand page, the aims. It's the subject content, which actually encompasses the aims, but it's the subject content that really, really counts. So a key question for you today is how should you be planning your music curriculum to best provide the increasing accuracy and the increasing fluency, the increasing sophistication and the increasing discrimination? Is it most effectively planned through topic coverage of styles, genres, and repertoire, a term on this, a term on that, half term on this, half term on that? Or is it most effectively planned through planning the incremental development of musical knowledge? I'm going to just buy in a moment, but uh, let me talk to you, and Catherine mentioned our research review. Because our research review identifies that musical development is the result of three things. It's the result of pupils' development in the technical knowledge and technical skills of music. Musical development is the result of pupils' progressive, incremental development of knowledge and skills of the constructive parts of music. And it's also musical development is the result of their progressive building of knowledge and skills around the expressive areas of musical learning. And those three things are not silos, they're not isolated, they are interdependent and they work together. And the reason I put the heart in the middle of that Venn diagram is to show that's where the musical understanding comes. It's not just about learning to play an instrument or learning to sing. It's not just about me and composer. It's not just about listening to the works of the great composers. You become a musician. Your musical development happens as a result of all those things working together. So let's talk about technical knowledge. Technical knowledge is about incrementally building the technique of singing, and I include posture, body, projection, control range, and playing instruments, hand-body musical control. That's knowledge. You've got to know 
way to put your hands. You've got to know how to breathe. That's knowledge. It's always a skill. There's a false divide, isn't it, between knowledge and skills? Because knowledge is skills, skills is knowledge. But that's got to be built incrementally through the curriculum. Music tech is part of that. Incrementally building knowledge of the tech, the music tech as an instrument. But incrementally over time. And also, we include notation, tablature, programming, and so on as a, a technical system for controlling, but also for a recording music over time. That's got to build incrementally as pupils move through year groups in school. Let's have a look at constructive, because constructive is about how music works. It's understanding scales, chords, keys, systems, forms, and structures incrementally as pupils go from year one to six or seven to nine. And then using that knowledge, and I've used, and I, I'm, I'm pleased with these terms because they resonate actually with English teaching. Deconstruction, analyzing, deconstructing music, taking apart the component parts, the constructs of music, and seeing how they work together. Reconstructing, taking music which is crazy by others, and then interpreting it using the scales, the forms, the keys, and giving your own performance, and then constructing, using that constructive knowledge to make your own music to compose. That's constructive, um, the constructive pillar of learning. And then when we come to expressive, again, it's about building uh, an increasing and connected knowledge of music's provenance, as some have used for some years in Olmsted in music education, the history of music, the culture of music, the social background of music, the geography, the purpose and the meaning, or should we say the meanings of music. Understanding how those musical elements, uh, dynamic, timbre, pitch and so on, work together in the interrelated ways of musical expression, and then applying the technical and constructive knowledge that you have with increasing sophistication to give that personal musical meaning. And you can see here in the expressive uh, pillar how the technical and constructive come together with the expressive. You know, and when you see on the timetable expressive arts, Expressive arts aren't just about being expressive. They should be about technical and constructive as well. So, you know, perhaps if you've got expressive arts in your school, you should call it technical, constructive, and expressive arts, maybe. Who knows? But as I say to you, this, um, these three pillars work together to give music understanding. They are not silos, they are interdependent. They work together to give that musical understanding. Now then, here's uh, something interesting. Here's a curriculum, a scheme of work, and it's real. Um, this is from a school we have inspected um, and um, this was presented to inspectors as the scheme work key stage and I'm sure uh, lots of people will recognize this kind of scheme work in key stage three. Now, I have to say that when we inspect, we would never judge a school on one document. But this document, this overview of the scheme work, would raise a number of questions for me as an inspector. I'd want to know how doing graphic scores in autumn term one, followed by the orchestra, followed by program music, followed by two terms of notation and keyboard, and then music of China, and so on. How are pupils developing increasing technical and constructive accuracy and fluency 
between year seven and year nine. How does the technical knowledge they gain through autumn term one in year seven build the next term and then build the term after and build the term after that and build the term after that? What about the increasing sophistication in musical response or the increasing discrimination in listening? How is that planned for and how is that built as they move from term to term in that school? And does that program of study, the way they've organized it there, provide a deepening understanding across the musics they listen to? And does that program really meet the ambition that's set out by the National Curriculum? Sure, it covers the aims. I'm absolutely convinced it will cover the aims. There's some singing in there. There's some playing instruments in there. There's going to be the elements of music, I dare say. You know, they're going to listen to some classical music, some pop music, music from around the world. It will tick all of those boxes in the aims and they will say yeah we meet the ambition of national but do you really graphic scores you know typically we see the graphic score being used in key stage one in primary school now of course nothing wrong with using graphic scores in secondary school even up to a level even beyond but actually how does that build on what's gone before in uh, primary school. What's the difference between Funk and Disco 1 and Funk and Dis Disco 2? Reggae 1 and Reggae 2. Why has Reggae got two terms when music from Africa has got one term? Um, and so those are the questions I would have going into that school. And if I go on to the questions that uh, I asked uh, earlier on, you know, which is the easiest and the most desirable to define the green? If we build the curriculum as we did in that school, just now, the one I've shown you, if we give it, build it on styles, genres, and repertoire that we want pupils to encounter, that's quite easy, isn't it? That's quite easy to program. That's quite easy to, you know, to, to write a document for. But is it a curriculum that builds on the technical, constructive and expressive knowledge that we want pupils to acquire before they start GCC and beyond? And which of the, those two there, the one that I'm showing you, the one that's built on styles and repertoire and genres, or the one that's built on technical, constructive, and expressive, which will give the pupils the wherewithal to embark on further study, a lifetime of meaningful music making, intelligent listening. Because, you know, we need to think about our curriculum. And I suggest to you that a curriculum is fit for purpose for GCSE and A-level, but not just for the exams, to give pupils the wherewithal to actually move forward and enjoy music in later life is going to be well sequenced and it's one that's based on intrinsic musical development rather than a collection of musical styles and genres. And it has to be a curriculum that incrementally builds pupils' technical, constructive, and expressive knowledge of music. And think about Key Stage 3. Think about your Year 7s when they start in Year 7. And think about, in terms of personal development, what they mature into at the end of Year 9. Think about the sophistication of their development as they move between years, personal development between Year 7 and 9. Do we re reflect that in our musical curriculum, in our music curriculum in schools? Now, it's not all gloomy. 
because there was some fantastic music making in this country. We inspected a, a score very recently in, in London um, where music was deep dive and it was world class. It was absolutely world class. You're here on the radio this weekend, some advent services with choirs of young people singing, singing really well, singing expertly. Something music you see at the school's prom recently is just fantastic, but it's inconsistent. And if we want music to be a robust subject, if we want it to be treated seriously, We've got to do more than just providing activity. If we want young people to take GCSE music and see it as a serious option, Key Stage 3 needs to be a serious course. It needs to be a robust, rigorous course. There are some schools that do it, but not enough. Thank you for listening. I hope that was useful. I hope it was provoke some uh, discussion. I know there are some questions, Catherine, you want to ask me, you've got been sent in beforehand, but I'll say thank you for now. And um, uh, it's really good to, to speak to you. Thank you, colleagues. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. And it's so reassuring to hear you speak. And especially we get right into the nitty gritty of what music is about. And after all, that's in fact what our curriculum should be with music right at the heart. So we've had some questions uh, in advance and also some are coming through the Q&A and the chat. So thank you very much to everyone for the contributions. I suppose I, one of the themes that have come through in the questions in advance, particularly um, around curriculum, are about curriculum as the in the substance of inspection, because curriculum is cle clearly really important, um, uh, especially through the lens of the deep dive. And I, there are some teachers who worry that when a non-specialist is involved in this process, that um, that it may that things may be lost or they're not able to really demonstrate what they want to. Um, what's your view on this? Okay, um, good question. Thank you. Um, obviously, inspectors in HMI will inspect everything. In, you know, when I inspect the school, I will do a deep dive in science or in modern languages. We are trained and we are providing our inspectors with detailed subject training. But remember that a deep dive in music is not an inspection of music in the school. It's an inspection of the school. So we will ask questions. And you know, I hope very much that our inspectors will ask the right questions about sequencing, about the, uh, the, the three pillars, the technical, the constructive and the expressive. And you will show them. But remember, it's a two-way process. Mm. You must show us what you have. And, you know, I hope inspectors won't ask you to see, uh, to show books. You know, I've said very clearly, books uh, are, are not really necessary in music education. But show us the recordings. Show us your recordings if you work. Explain to us how they make progress. Because part of inspection is listening to what you have to say. It's really important we listen to what you have to say. And remember, we're inspecting the school, not your department. We're not going to give you a grade. So, for example, you say, you know, we're given less curriculum time for music. That's not an issue about you. That's an issue for the school leaders. And we're going to go to them and say, why are you doing this? If the music teacher says, I'm not allowed to come out on courses because I'm a one-person department, so I'm not allowed to have as much CVD as the English teacher, we'll say, what's going on? We'll ask the questions. So inspections, we're asking questions. Um, inspectors are trained and they've got subject knowledge and they've been taught, um, they've been uh, trained about music education and they've been given the questions to ask and the areas to look at, but it's down to you as well. Thank you, because I know that teachers really want to reach the ambition of the national curriculum, and I'm sure actually most teachers want to exceed the ambition of the national curriculum if they have the chance to, but sometimes that feeling that the structures around them 
provide constraints, don't they? Whether that's, mm. like you said, the shortened key stage three, or it might be um, less time in the timetable because there are so only so many hours in the day and mm. there's so much going on. In reality, how does that play out in inspection? Every school is different. And I, I'm sorry to be boring, but, you know, we would ask questions. Um, you know, I, I've gone the record about this before. So I said, again, about carousels, for example, you know, if music is in a carousel, uh, a key stage three, typically it'd be art, music and DT run to art, music and drama. Mm. Drama is interesting because it's part of English. But let's just say art, music and DC. Why are art, music and DC on a carousel when geography, history, and modern languages aren't, because they're all foundation subjects, aren't they? So, head teacher, can you just explain why that's the case? The answers are many. You know, it could be you know we can't get the staff, we we're not being able to get the the special teachers. It could be well, actually, um, the quality of music has not been good at the school, therefore we had to take a decision. Um, and, you know, there are unintended consequences of case H4 as well, aren't there? Yes. Um, and, but we'll ask the questions. We'll ask the questions. Uh, it could be, they say, well, there's not much in the curriculum for music, is there? And there's quite clear answers to that, isn't there? And that is, there should be, and it's what you make of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And connected to that you know we we have unfortunately seen a national decline uh you know at key stage mm. four both gcse vocational qualifications mm. a level um i'd be interested to know what your view is about what's going on there and and what what we you know what the future of that you think might mm. be well i mean and let's be clear you're talking about the year back of course not you catherine um uh but so, um, that, let's be very clear about this. The e bank is a key stage four measure. And you know, I, I don't believe that any minister or governments um, or officer that ever said is anything other than key stage four. Now, uh, there may be unintended consequences in some schools and decisions made by some schools, not by ministers, not by governments but by some schools that have had a knock-on effect into case stage three. And that may be the case. But, you know, that's, that's look at ourselves. Because young people would not take GCSE music if the experience they get in case stage three is poor. Mm. If the time they spend in case stage three is poor and it's wasted, they will not invest their hard and time their valuable choices at key stage four, will they? So you know, key stage three is key. We've got to get key stage three right. We can do that as a community. Music teachers can do that. Um, yeah. You know, we, we can talk about the other uh, problems with key stage four music, the, yeah. you know, the untended consequences as much as you like. But the one thing we can do something about is to get that key stage three right. And there are schools where there are 30, 40, 50, 60 young people taking GCSE music mm -hmm. at Key Stage 4. And I've been to those schools. I know the reason why. And the reason why is because the Key Stage 3 is brilliant. It's robust and it's rigorous. Mm. End of. Full mm. stop. <laughs> so that... Uh... Key stage three mm. is really the driver at the heart of everything. And prior to that, the good foundation that comes from primary schools yes. and the great work that happens in that part of the yes. sector as well. Um, to, to, just to think about primary schools particularly, and this I'm partly talking about my own experience and the teachers that I work with, mm. um, and this has come through on the questions as well. Mm. One obstacle that some people find in schools is about confidence. 
teacher mm. confidence. And we know that a lot of our workforce are professionally isolated. They might be working on their own one man mm. band departments. I have definitely been there, done that. Mm. Um, and I'm sure you have as well in your in your career as well. Um, and as part of kind of I think ongoing CPD is really important mm. uh, and subject knowledge development and subject knowledge enhancement. Um, do you think what particular effective strategies do you see for that in your in your role? Well, I, I, I've got to be honest with you. I've never worked in a one man, one person, or one man in my case, but one person <laughs> department. Um, I've always been very lucky mm. to have colleagues in my team who I've worked with who are taught in the curriculum um, and, and Perry teachers, you know, a, a team of 10, 12 Perry teachers mm. teaching instruments. Um, and so I've always been very lucky. Um, and you know, works in local authorities where there's been a strong music uh, service, as was Music Hub, as now is, um, working collaboratively. And you know, that, let's be honest. You know, we all have our personal musical preferences and styles mm. and things we're comfortable with. Um, the problem is when we try to invent the curriculum which is based on what we like and what we think the children like and what we think is, is current, um, rather than looking at principles of learning and principles of musical technique and musical constructs mm. and the history of music. You know, I've got behind me um, books on the history of music education. I've got one by a, a chap called John Huller, who was actually um, lead music HMI in the 1890s, I think, and it's his his method of singing. And actually, you know, it's a bit old fashioned. Um, and it's not quite sing up, but um, but you know, it talks about incrementally building the singing technique from the start, step by step, stage by stage. If you look at Cyril Wynne's methods from the 1930s. Uh, even look at music and second school curriculum, John Painter, um, you know, in the 1980s, it builds up incrementally. And those principles have gone right throughout music education and history. It's just the repertoire and tastes have changed. And if we change our vision, we change our view of what good music is on, on whim, on fashion, I think we could lose quite a lot, really. I can say that because I'm old and <laughs> not fashionable. <laughs> well, you still have plenty of valid things to say. I'm sure all of us are feeling like that. And actually the experience that you bring, you know, we, we, if we were always reinventing the wheel, uh, mm. that doesn't feel like a very good use of, of time and energy. Um, what you're talking about there made me think about um, those, also the spiral curriculum models mm. um, about incremental building of, of skills and knowledge. And I know that's something that, uh, you know, uh, Martin Faultley, Ali Dorbney, the ISM frameworks, uh, where mm. it really comes through strongly. Um, uh, just to sort of like shift focus a little bit, but um, on to, again, this, uh, how, so we, we, the curriculum itself, mm. when it's sequenced, the progression is in the curriculum. But I think the uh, teachers worry about how they evidence that through the recordings and through the conversations they have um like what balance of the pillars um how do you how it's expected to see in the planning documentation how do you expect people to talk about them um well let's talk, about, about, let's talk, about, let's talk about recordings first okay okay if you're an english teacher as an english teacher do you write pupils essays for them in their books you don't do you you get the pupils to write so why isn't recording one of the skills we teach pupils where they record their own work habitually rather than the teacher being at the front doing the recording shouldn't pupils be recording their work as they go and saving their work as they go and presenting their recordings mm -hmm. as they go as part of music education you know, I, I can remember, you know, 40 years ago, 
standing in front of the class with my cassette recorder and my one microphone. We, that's all he has. Mm. But now we've got handheld devices, we've got iPads, we've got so much we can do. Shouldn't recording be part of that technical knowledge that pupils have about music so they can listen back to their own recording and edit? Mm. It, it's not the, it's like assessment, you know, recording isn't a thing that you do at the end of. It's an ongoing activity which is integral to musical learning. So mm. you don't get worried about assessment and don't get worried about recording. Make it natural. Make it part of your your behaviour, yes. your pupils' behaviour. What was the other question? I've forgotten. So um, how you would... Uh, so we had a question about what... Um, how would you maybe within planning documentation you know within the curriculum overview for example uh, I know quite you know schools on their websites need to have their curriculum maps or curriculum documentation there Um, and I I would anticipate that an HMI or an OI would Mm. go and have a look at that before they were to visit a school so what do you think they would expect to see so uh, okay okay (laughs) documentation Mm doesn't drive practice Mm. documentation reflects practice okay yeah so if i go to school and they say well today we're doing a technical lesson or today we're doing a constructive lesson or today we're doing an expressive lesson i'd worry Mm. because today we're doing a music lesson which typically will have a bit of technical in a bit of constructive, a bit of expressive, working together uh, collaboratively. And so, you know, think about the way you teach musically Mm. and then think about the way you behave as a musician and you learn as a musician and let that drive your planning. Rather than planning in theory and then delivering in theory, Mm. plan in practice. It's, it's reversing, isn't it? It's flipping the process. Is that helpful? Yes, that is helpful. Um, um, and for me, that's connected to how um, there is a real risk, isn't there, when schools want to um, ensure consistency and quality mm. assure across a whole school. And then mm. when you see um, mm. uh, implementation of things like, uh, of policies or, mm. or programs, you know, for example, mm. reading within the curriculum, literacy within the curriculum, numeracy in the curriculum, and the mm. subject has to bend and fit or a particular lesson structure, those sorts of things uh, that doesn't align well with how a music lesson needs to be planned and delivered. But, but don't we need to be intelligent about this, mm. Catherine? And actually, be musicians. Mm. You know, I've had a question recently about reading. You know, a whole school policy is about reading. Whole school policy is about reading, um, and we've been told we have to do reading in every lesson. Mm. Fine, no problem. Are you can sing a song in your lesson. Has it got words? Are you can read them. Job done. Yeah, box ticked. Um, you know, that's being intelligent about this. You know, a do now activity, a do now activity. Every lesson will start with a do now. Okay, sing a song. Yeah. Do a clapping game. Do do a bit of rhythm work. You mm. know, make it musical. Just be creative about it, yeah. and be musically intelligent about it. And then tell the head, "This is what I'm doing. This is what." I mean, you know, we. If you were teaching French and they said every lesson must start with a reading activity, what would you do? Would you read something in English? I don't, or would you read something in French? You know, I haven't ever taught French, but I assume it would be in French. Well, you'd hope so, wouldn't yeah. you? You'd <laughs> hope so, because you know, if, if it's a French lesson, there's not much French and it, it's probably not a French lesson. Mm. Same with music, you know, if, if it's a music lesson. And there's not much music. It's probably not a music lesson. Mm. So the reading doesn't just have to be about you know reading a book or uh, phonics or what what have you. You can teach phonics really well through singing, of course. Mm. Of course mm. you can. Great. Mm. 
Mm. I think I remember seeing in, was it wider and wider still? There was some really good advice about that as well, about literacy in the curriculum not being about, um, you know, baggage, cabbage sheets, but also oh, no. about, yeah, um, yeah, also about songwriting, lyrics, yes. and analysis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's yeah. within the context of the subject. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. And uh, so we've had, again, sort of linked to this about curriculum and thinking about that transition between key stage I suppose key stage one to two in some settings where you might have um, juniors and, and middle mm. school um, but the key one being key stage two to key stage three that feels mm. like a really important moment um, mm. some I think some teachers worry that it can be very hit and miss mm. and they'd love to push on with a very ambitious curriculum but they're worried about the gaps and uh, they want to bring everybody with them no matter what their starting points mm. uh, what's your view on that and yes look oh we have to start from the beginning we have, we have to start, start from scratch you hear it all the time mm. we do our first set on the elements of music you know that goes on in key stage one um and you know within two weeks the pupils are a bit bored really um, think about 11-year-olds, think about sophistication, think about what they can do quite easily, what they can pick up. They've all got ears, they've all got voices, you know. Um, how quickly do you start singing in secondary school? I, I, I don't answer that question, but how, 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 quickly to singing start in secondary school it's just start lesson one first thing you do we're going to sing a song how quick does that i i i i really hear of it ever at all you know the rules of the classroom the elements of music the keyboard and, you know um so singing everyone's got a voice start singing see what happens just see what happens. Throw something at them. You know, throw a song at them. Throw a piece of music. Throw a rhythm game at them and see how they respond. Mm. Or give them a worksheet and say, tick all the things you did in primary school. And, uh, you know, no, don't do that. <laughs> I suppose in some sense it is interesting and useful to audit and to see what their prior experiences may be and who's learned what instruments and what do they do outside of school. But you're, the starting with sound, that's what I keep on what I yeah. keep on hearing for you there. And I think I can't remember who where that quote comes from, but I refer to it an awful lot in what I talk about. Uh, but that feels like the, the starting point for everything. Yeah. yeah. Get them in, get them singing get them rhythmic, get them playing, just engage them musically um, and see where it goes, mm -hmm. see where it goes. Yeah. Of course, it's been so hard with singing in the mm. past year and a half. Um, it's almost been, I don't want to use the word demonised, but there is a lot of anxiety mm. around singing. Yeah. Um, and I've certainly seen that in the schools that I've been working with. Um, the and there's lots of good I just wanted to chip in there's quite a lot of good guidance out still out there from Music Mark and from Sing Up and the BCM and um, I don't want to do too many plugs for MTA but the Music Teachers Association our recent uh, magazine ensemble magazine had a very good set of resources about how you can build back ensembles and get singing restarted and talking about ensembles there's I think the new framework there's some really great stuff about um, the wider curriculum and how important that is um, in terms of um, cultural capital, character development, personal development uh, in, in those judgments. Uh, what's, what's your view on what high quality looks like in the sort of enrichment space? There's two ways of looking at this, of course. There is high quality in terms of, of uh, you know, um, you know, beautiful music well music well played music well composed music um ably performed and it's important to have those standards but it's also important to have participation as well isn't it mm. and i'm not sure that we've got that right in 
music education. And actually, I'm going to talk about Key Stage 2 as well. Because, you know, whole class ensemble teaching rightly has an ambition that every child to, should learn to play an instrument. And that participation is really good. I know, you know the Arts Council will look at the hubs and will um, part of their criteria is number of uh, young people they've reached in the year with their first access. But it's what happens next. And how many of those young people carry on playing? Mm. So it's not just a question of having an activity the young people playing once. You know, we have a show once a year mm. where every child will play the violin. Are those young people playing um, in two years' time, three years' time, four years' time? And I've asked those questions, actually, and I look at the hubs and I ask them the same, you know, it's great that you've got 5,000 children in your, your local authority having first access, how many of them are playing in two years' time? Mm. Have you got more ensembles in your local authority than you had 10 years ago? Are more children playing in school ensembles? Are those children the people, premium children, special needs children? Do you know? And that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Do you actually know? Or is it the usual suspects who will always do well because I've got support. And can I go back to the, the, the past two years, Catherine, because it's really important to say thank you again mm. to all colleagues who work so hard in schools. Not just live, but you know, some of the stuff you see online has been fantastic, really good. Mm. Um, and some of the heads have been so supportive. Yes. I know a head locally. To where I live, who actually gave the music teacher the school hall to be their classroom for a year or so. Yes. So that the children could be spaced out and could sing and play. Now, that's the importance of head teachers. It really is. Um, other schools say oh, it's too risky, it's not possible. Mm. And I understand that. I'm not being critical, I get that. And you know, people are anxious, people are worried, but you know, people have been making things work and work so hard. So, I want to say thank you mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, I agree. Really through, through the MTA, we hear stories about how people really have moved mountains mm -hmm. over the past mm -hmm. 18 months mm -hmm. and are forever being determined to do whatever they can. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really it's so inspiring yeah. and uh. Our, and we know that our subject has been impacted more than most because it yes. was so hard to to translate well online, yes. even yeah. though we we all tried very hard in order yeah. to be able to do that. And I have to say, you know, music teachers have been very generous. Uh, or, you know, mm -hmm. some music teachers have been very generous over the past year. And musicians too, you know, free performances online, rock bands giving gigs online, doing sessions. It's been really good, heartening to see. And we, we should never forget that, really, of how generous uh, the music community have been in many ways. Yes. Well, while also being very kind to ourselves about, you know, being re realistic about what is achievable as well. Yeah. I think, you know, yes. um, yeah. everyone, there's still significant absence in schools. There's yes. still, we're still not back to normal. Uh, no. And um, we're still, it's a challenging time, not quite out of yeah. words yet, are we? But, you know, let's go back to the whole class uh, instrument teaching key stage two. I do worry about progression. Mm -hmm. I worry about. Um, you know, it's a key question on the curriculum, all year four do violin in year four. So what happens in year five? And how do they build on that learning, that knowledge in year five progressively? Mm -hmm. Schools don't know. Mm, yes. Um, and, and, and also the question about is um, whole class ensemble tuition, is that your curriculum? Yes, exactly. Question mark. Exactly. Yes. How can it therefore be yeah. part of the sequence yes. and how can it be progressive? Yes. yes. Um, uh, there are schools that do. Uh, of course, there are schools that do. Mm. But there are lots of schools that don't. Um, and you, they see it as a way of covering the curriculum. 
mm. frankly. Mm. Um, and more thought needs to go into it, really. Mm. Yes, well, um, the National Plan for Music Education um, is due out uh, in the next few months, and I'm sure there'll be some interesting content in there mm. for everyone to think about as we look ahead for the next 10 years, because we've had 11 years of, you know, the hubs in existence, which just leaves me, I've got maybe one one more very quick question. Um, you know, the you've talked about collaboration, partnership, working with uh, the service and the hub and local teachers. Um, do you think there'll ever be a, a situation where Offset will be looking at hubs? That's a matter for the Department for Education. Um, uh, our, our brief uh, in law is to inspect schools uh, provision we inspect it provision we inspect local area send of course but it's all set out in law um it's important to remember that inspection is legal mm. um uh, section 5 of the education act section 109 um, of the education act for an independent school um and it's really important to remember it's in law so you know it's a matter for government really Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so there have been lots of questions, probably more than we were able to cover in the session, but um, I'm sure if people have burning needs to continue the conversation, there's still uh, an opportunity to, to make to reach out. Um, Mark has very generously shared his Twitter handle, and I know that here at the MTA, we're always really um, happy to have conversations and answer questions with the various sessions that we have on offer and, and the, the continuing um, program of events, which leads me to sort of begin to wrap up the session. I just wanted to, again, say a huge thank you to Mark, who is so generous with his insight and um, advice and it's very, as I said, it's reassuring to those of us who are working in the profession to, to hear from your experiences. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, oh, it's a pleasure. Session. And thank you again, colleagues, everything you do. Um, you know, I, I often say um, the two words you associate with Ofsted are not usually thank you, but I think we should be saying that really because we know the work you do um, and, uh, you know, uh, so much is good, so much is good in our schools. We just need to get the standards up. And remember, and you know, Office of Standards and Education Standards is at the centre of what we do. And we just want to get young people musical, give them the skills and knowledge they need for life um, so that they can be intelligent listeners uh, when they leave school. They can take part. Um, and they can, you know, uh, enjoy music. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And you know, that is really what we're all about as a subject association or Music Teachers Association, bringing together mm. colleagues so that we can all do that together and supporting each other. Mm. Um, if this is the first time that you've encountered the MTA, welcome. You are hugely welcome as part of this process. And just if you weren't aware, there's lots of activity that goes on, on around this group of colleagues. All of us, the majority of us are volunteers. There's a small professional team who help us in the back office but most of us are volunteers who put our time together so we can support other colleagues. If you wanted to look at a membership, you can contact Sophie and her email address is on the screen here. And some of the offer here is, is available at no cost anyway. So uh, the podcast, if you haven't heard that, it's fantastic. I know Mark's been part of it, uh, but uh, Patrick Johns leads that and it's, it's brilliant. There's online CPD, not just this kind of spotlight session, but other sessions that are all um, recorded and within the website. There's regular bulletins. We have a fantastic magazine. We have an annual conference and more and more and more. And it would be wonderful uh, if you felt able to be part of that. Just to be clear as well, for trainees and early career teachers, it's free for the first year. So nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my plug now so uh, tick that box but yeah really uh, thank you again for joining us uh, this uh, for this session and we look forward to seeing you again thanks everybody thank you bye 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 thank you